Hi, and thanks for tuning in. Today we're going to be talking about nucleic acids, polymers that consist of nucleotide monomers and are largely responsible for storage of genetic information and the conversion of that genetic information into proteins. So stay tuned. Hi, and thanks for tuning in. Today we're going to continue our conversation about biological macromolecules and talk about nucleic acids. So nucleic acids are one of the four major groups of biological macromolecules, along with lipids, carbohydrates, and proteins. Now like carbohydrates and proteins, nucleic acids are polymers that consist of nucleotide monomers. And the type of nucleotide monomers that make up a nucleic acid depend on which type of nucleic acid we're talking about. Broadly, there are two major classes of nucleic acids. You've got your deoxyribonucleic acid, or DNA, and you've got your ribonucleic acids, or RNA. Now, like all biological macromolecules, when we synthesize nucleic acid polymers, we are going to use dehydration synthesis, or condensation reactions, and when we break them down, we will be using hydrolysis. Quite simply, to make them, we remove a, a water equivalent. When we break them down, we're going to add that water back in and use it to break the molecule apart through hydrolysis. Of course, all of these reactions are going to be dictated by special protein catalysts called enzymes that are incredibly specific and help to speed up and facilitate those particular reactions. So let's not waste a lot of time. Let's get right into talking about what nucleic acids do for cells. Nucleic acids have two major roles. If we're talking about deoxyribonucleic acid, or DNA, DNA functions mainly in the capacity as genetic information storage. On the other hand, ribonucleic acid, or RNA, functions mainly in converting that genetic information into sort of usable information in the form of a protein, which is another type of biological macromolecule that we'll talk about in another video. Now, DNA and RNA are incredibly similar. They're all made up of nucleotides. And those nucleotides have very similar structures, but there are a few subtle differences that have a large impact on the way DNA and RNA are structured, as well as the way they behave. So first, let's start by talking about DNA. DNA consists of nucleotides, adenine, guanine, cytosine, and thymine. Now, if we look at a nucleotide, we'll see that all nucleotides have three major parts. They are going to have a five carbon ribose sugar. They are going to be attached, that ribose sugar is going to be attached on one end to a base, and on the other end, it's going to be attached to a phosphate group. Now, the big difference between deoxyribonucleic acids and ribonucleic acids is on that ribose sugar. You can see that on DNA, one of those sugars, or one of the carbons on the sugar is bound to a single hydrogen as opposed to a hydroxyl group. When we look at the five carbon ribose sugar on an RNA molecule, both of those carbons have a hydroxyl group. That's it, that's the difference. Hence the term deoxyribonucleic acid. It's missing an oxygen atom. That's it, that's the big difference between a DNA base and a RNA base, that one single oxygen, the absence of a hydroxyl group. But what happens when DNA molecules are synthesized? Well, it's simple. An enzymatic reaction is performed by an enzyme called DNA polymerase. And DNA polymerase will add sequential nucleotides to each other through covalent bonds and they begin to stack up on top of one another, okay? This linkage that combines those two, the bases together is by linking the phosphate group of one nucleotide to the sugar of the next nucleotide in order. This is what's called a phosphodiester bond, and it's a covalent bond that holds those nucleotides together. Now, what's interesting, though, is in all living things, and I stress all living things, which means I'm excluding viruses, which we'll get to in a minute. In all living things, DNA is double-stranded. 
That means when you look at a DNA molecule, it's not a single strand of nucleotide monomers attached to form the uh, nucleic acid. It's actually two strands. And the reason for this is that those bases on the other end are able to hydrogen bond with each other. So if you think of a DNA molecule as being a spiral staircase, it's also actually called a double-stranded alpha helix, but think of it as a spiral staircase. The backbone or the railings of that spiral staircase are formed from the sugar phosphate, sugar phosphate alternating covalent bonds. So we call a sugar phosphate backbone. But inside the rungs of that staircase, the steps of that spiral staircase are formed by the hydrogen bonds between two opposing strands of nucleic acid. DNA in all living things is double stranded. And what's interesting is there are base pairing rules. It turns out that not every nucleotide, not every base is able to hydrogen bond with another base. In fact, there are rules. Whenever we look at DNA, the two strands are hydrogen bonded to each other as follows. Guanines always hydrogen bond to cytosines, whereas adenines always bond to thymines. Which means if we know what the nucleotide sequence is on one strand of DNA, we automatically know what the nucleotide sequence on the other strand of DNA is, don't we? That's called complementarity. Two strands of DNA molecule, two strands of a DNA molecule are always complementary to each other. But here's the other interesting thing. Because those covalent bonds, because the stacking of the nucleotides always occurs sugar phosphate, sugar phosphate, sugar phosphate, there actually is a directionality associated with DNA. What that means is one end is labeled as the three prime end because the three prime carbon, they're numbered is at the bottom, whereas the five prime end is at the top. But here's the really interesting part. In order for the hydrogen bonding to occur appropriately among the bases, the other strand has to be upside down relative towards it. So while one strand runs three prime to five prime in this direction, the other strand has to go three prime to five prime in this direction. They are anti-parallel. And for this reason, DNA is referred to as a double-stranded, anti-parallel alpha helix. And that's the basic structure of DNA. And the main role of DNA in all living systems is to store genetic information. It doesn't really have any enzymatic activity and it doesn't really do anything else. In eukaryotes, that DNA is stuck, stuck firmly in the protective membrane of the, inside the membranous nucleus, where DNA is, is protected away and protected from damage. If we want to turn that genetic information into something more useful, i.e. a protein, we have to rely on the second form of nucleic acid, which is RNA. So what about RNA, ribonucleic acid? Ribonucleic acid is the other major form of nucleic acid that we find in all living cells. Now, ribonucleic acid has a lot of similarities to DNA, but it also has some differences. For example, if you remember when we look at the ribose sugar in the nucleotides, you will note that there is that extra hydroxyl group that slightly changes its chemical properties. But if you look at the nucleotide structure, it's very similar in the fact that you're going to have that ribose sugar attached to a phosphate group on one end and a base on the other, an nitrogenous base on the other. There's a subtle difference here. While the nucleotide bases found on DNA are adenine, cytosine, guanine, and thymine. In RNA, we're gonna switch out the thymine. It's gonna have adenine, it's gonna have cytosine, it's gonna have guanine, but instead of thymine, we're going to have uracil. There's only a very small difference between uracil and thymine, but it has an, a major impact. They are, different, they are different nucleotides. And also, unlike DNA, while RNA is going to have that sugar phosphate backbone, there will be no base pairing because RNA does not form a double-stranded helix like DNA does. In fact, in all living things, and again, I stress all living things, RNA is single-stranded. Now, I shouldn't have said that there is no base pairing at all because lots of different RNA molecules can base pair, and they base pair using the same base pair rules. They base pair with adenines, 
bonding to uracils instead of thymines, and guanines binding to cytosines. However, it's always within a single strand. There's no second strand to bond to. So what ends up happening is essentially some RNA molecules, things like tRNAs, transfer RNAs, and ribosomal RNAs, they will interact within themselves to hydrogen bond and give that particular RNA molecule a three-dimensional structure. But I need to stress, these are not double-stranded RNA molecules. They are single-stranded RNA molecules that just happen to be hydrogen bonding within itself to fold up on itself. Also, in living things, RNA is not a form of genetic information storage like DNA does. RNA's job is to help to convert that information from the form of DNA and relay that message to the ribosome to help encode a protein. So while we will talk at length about the processes of transcription and translation, RNA's major job is sort of in that intermediate step. When a gene needs to be expressed, when the information contained within a gene needs to be turned into something useful, which is usually in the form of a protein, the first step in that process is an enzyme called RNA polymerase is going to read the DNA and synthesize a new molecule of RNA. This is typically in the form of messenger RNA. And that messenger RNA then relays the information contained within that DNA gene to a, 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 an organelle called the ribosome. And the ribosome then reads that messenger RNA and turns that into a protein which could be an enzyme or a transporter or something like that. And, and if you want to know more information about proteins, see my video on proteins. We'll talk about those in another video. But that's the major job of RNA. Now, RNA has a few other jobs. Uh, for example, there is ribosomal RNA. So that ribosome organelle that does the actual translation step of converting that messenger RNA information to proteins, that's actually about 50% ribosomal RNA. It's actually a, an organelle that's half protein, half RNA. There's also transfer RNAs. Transfer RNAs work within the ribosome to help decode the messenger RNA. And there are also these things that are called non-coding RNAs. And these have only been fairly recently discovered in the past 20 years or so, and we're really just beginning to understand what non-coding RNAs do. But what's really interesting is they seem to have a major role in determining how much a gene is expressed. They have the ability in eukaryotic cells, at least, to sort of fine tune the level of gene expression by interfering with the production or the survivability of messenger RNAs. Not really something we're gonna cover in this course, uh, but still very, very interesting nonetheless. So that's it for our conversation about nucleic acids. Remember, nucleic acids uh, are pretty much just DNA and RNA, and they are broken down and, and built by nucleotide monomers. Remember that DNA and RNA have slightly different nucleotide monomers with uracil replacing thymine, uh, when we convert to RNA. Remember, DNA in all living things is double-stranded. RNA is single-stranded. DNA is genetic information storage, whereas RNA is used for the conversion of that genetic information into proteins through the process of transcription and then translation. But also remember, nucleotides or nucleic acids are very important as a form of energy currency in the cell. They are sort of the way energy moves about our cell and gets utilized by enzymes and other proteins to make life possible. Hope you guys learned a lot today. Thanks for tuning in, and I hope to see you guys again soon.